I am today without knowing a slight wobble when I enter one. I really got into television first off by writing jokes and sending them into TV shows, like the two Ronnies, not the nine o'clock news, and shows none of you uh, will remember because you're too young. I wanted to work in television since the age of 11. The first thing I ever I shot as a movie was someone with a large syringe and a cow. I was inspired by all the president's men. I wanted to be in the shady, dark car park, wearing a trench coat. When I went to the interview at Channel 4, I had no television. So I had to um, offer a bottle of champagne to the press officer there to send me loads of tapes. I wanted to be a record producer. The great album covers that I was interested in were made by people called graphic designers. Neville Brodie was my god. Whenever I delivered the mail to different bits of the, the business, I would sort of linger around and talk to people. I got a job reporting on a local football show. I just wanted experience working in the media, so whether it was local newspapers, hospital radio. I grew up without a television. At the final interview I was asked what is the name of Minnie Cordwell's cat in Coronation Street and I happened to know it was called Bobby. Valerie Singleton was my role model. I rang up the series producer and I said, you've got to give me a job, I'll come make tea, I'll do anything you want. Acted for three years and I was terrible at it. You're not on long, make your mark. Family has absolutely no background in media production. My dad made lino. I sort of fell into a career in the media. Some people seem to emerge from the womb wanting to be a news presenter. I wasn't one of those. Mark Sharman phoned me up and said, would I like to do their late night bulletin after news at 10? And you know, amazingly, when I look back at it, I remember thinking, it was so late. My BBC traineeship took me into radio initially, then news and current affairs. When you have a shrinking economy, more people end up out of work. There's every opportunity, no matter what the economic situation, for good people to uh, excel. The toughest times have produced the best TV. Gives a job. The media is all about telling stories. I like to hear people who watch content in the broadest sense. There are only very few of the big blue chip, shiny trainee ships. It is harder, but I also think there are different opportunities and perhaps there isn't an obvious career ladder. You want people to be able to escape with television. Never stop asking questions, asking what people think or how they do that. People will be expected to be multi-skilled. The more opportunities you get to work with people at the top of their game, it, 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 the better it is for you. We really have to think about the voices that we employ. Television should be about plurality of voices, about strong characters, about passionately held ideas. Storytelling and creativity and ideas are the blood of this industry. There will always be a platform for a great idea. The difficult bit is the great idea. People who can spot the unique, who are excited by a range of different ideas. Have your portfolio of material to prove that you really do care about this industry. Because if you don't, somebody else will. People come into the business need to build up a very big set of skills. If you haven't got that set, you're going to find it very tough. Find those opportunities. They're not going to land on your lap. You have to find them. Have an opinion on everything, but don't be too forceful about it, because you'll probably be wrong. Don't rush. Really spend some time developing your skills and your craft. Work out who you want to work for. Pester them without annoying them. Half fine line. Got to know what you're talking about when you go and meet the people who are already doing it. It's maybe not a very nice word, but network. It's the willingness to go and knock on doors and make things happen, to find stories. Love television, fight for it, want it. It means champions. There's a lot of people in the industry who come in and vaguely think they want to work in television. Deep knowledge of television is invaluable, and I think you're very exposed if you don't have it. So many people that I interview, and you ask them, tell me about the shows you love, and they say, I don't watch that much television. When I'm interviewing people, they will talk about watching popular programmes as if it's some kind of guilty pleasure. It's meant to entertain. All the other stuff should come underneath. Don't be frightened to go off and do something that's just a bit different. You've got to live your life adventurously. Take the path that's going to give your talents the best opportunity. The very best way to, to, to get on is do great work. Keeping those people who are young, who are engaged, and who can think a little bit differently than dinosaurs like me, well, that's the future, and we all have to recognise that. Well, plenty of thoughts there to uh, start us off. Um, very warm welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Ben Bland. Um, I'm delighted to say I've got some great guests uh, for you in this session called So You Want to Get Into Broadcasting. And um, I'm hoping that's why you're all here, because you want to get into broadcasting. Um, over the next four days, you've got a wonderful opportunity. You'll be hearing from the uh, great and the good of the industry. Take that chance. Take the advantage of that, that you've got this direct time with these very top influential people. 
Uh, you should be networking like crazy the whole time. Uh, you're going to be meet lots and lots of people uh, and take that opportunity to ask all questions. There is no question too small or too silly. You know, speaking from experience, it's the, the questions that people come to you with and they say, it's a silly question and it's often the hardest ones to answer. So don't be shy about asking any questions. Um, and take the chance to find out all about working in TV and digital as well. Now we're doing this session right at the beginning of uh, the, the few days to give you a chance to think about the week ahead uh, and about your future careers in television and to get some top tips and ask anything uh, you'd like from the panel of experts uh, that I've got here with me. So let me just uh, briefly introduce who we have on the panel. We'll start at this end and we have uh, Bianca Joseph. Uh, Bianca got her break with YCTV, uh, which is a cable channel aimed at teaching uh, media production to young people. That gave her the sort of skills and experience to get a, a job at the BBC as a studio runner. She worked on some of the big shiny floor entertainment shows, uh, children's shows, music shows. Uh, spent a, a spell as a researcher on The Weakest Link uh, and then went freelance um, and moved her way up um, to become a producer, working on shows like First Dates, The Cube, Total Wipeout, Surprise, Surprise, so a broad range of, um, of programs there. And just last year, uh, Bianca joined ITV Studios as uh, entertainment talent executive. So uh, that role means she finds editorial talent to work on programs like I'm a Celebrity, uh, Saturday Night Takeaway, The Voice, Love Island, and others as well. Um, interesting fact about Bianca, you may not know this, that she appeared in the very first scene of the Harry Potter film. Well, she did say to me, it was the first Diagon Alley scene, not the uh, cupboard under the stairs, because that would just be a bit weird. So, <laughs> uh, Bianca, uh, thank you um, and welcome. Um, next, we have Natalie Humphreys. Natalie uh, has, a career, has built a career as a writer, director, producer, and executive uh, across all factual genres, uh, has seen her work for many broadcasters, including the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Sky, Discovery. So uh, experience of different types of broadcasters and organizations. Um, Natalie joined Shine Television um, as head of Specialist Factual, uh, where she developed um, and executive produced many of the uh, leading factual shows there. Most recently, um, Natalie's job was as controller of BBC Factual and Daytime Production, uh, looking after a budget, gosh, it's quite scary to read this, a hundred million pound budget and overseeing a thousand hours of content. Um, and that content made all over the UK by teams uh, working on arts, science, documentaries, history, business, religion, things like The One Show and uh, the BBC's um, very well regarded natural history unit. Interesting fact about Natalie, she studied zoology at Oxford, which has equipped her well to understand the weird creatures that you come across in broadcasting, I think. Um, to my left, we have Lee Dalloway. Lee is the BBC's um, uh, social media manager for BBC Comedy, um, where he gets um, the content that BBC Comedy um, produces and other content as well uh, out on the social media channels. So he was previously social media executive at BBC Three. He was part of the team that, as you may, may know, BBC Three moved from linear television, traditional broadcasting, to completely online. So he's part of the team that helped with that move. Uh, he's also social media producer for BBC Three's Free Speech. Uh, that's a politics show that gives young people a voice. Uh, and also uh, on the Victoria Derbyshire programme, um, working on the election debate specials. Uh, before uh, TV and social media, Lee spent seven years in publishing, including as deputy editor of Gay Times and QX magazines. Interesting fact about Lee, he worked backstage and as a receptionist in London's West End to pay his way through a writing degree. So the lesson from that, be nice to all the receptionists you come across because they may be in a position to, uh, to recruit you one day. And on the far end on the panel is Sarah Buckingham. Uh, Sarah's Director of Production with Princess Productions and Endemol Shine North, uh, splitting her time between London and Manchester. As if to prove that, she's turned I think, with the biggest suitcase of everyone today. Uh, uh, so, um, so Sarah's here with um, 20 years of experience in production management. That means she's covered um, uh, roles working across live, studio, factual, uh, entertainment, children's, comedy, events, commercials. Have I missed anything out? It's, it's quite a, an extensive list. Uh, and with all the different broadcasters. Her, her big break, her first break, came with Planet 24, working on Hotel Babylon and The Big Breakfast. She joined Princess uh, nearly 20 years ago, working her way up from production coordinator to uh, director on shows uh, such as Friday Night Project, Got to Dance, Stand Up to Cancer, and Idris Fighter. 
So she knows all about building really strong production teams. So it'd be good to get some um, thoughts from her about what she looks for when she's building those teams. Interesting fact about Sarah. She teaches yoga and bakes cakes, though I don't think at the same time. <laughs> And just briefly, a little bit about me. Um, I'm uh, a presenter and correspondent. I started working at a little television station in Manchester called Channel M. Great place to learn, develop. Um, from there, I got a job as a uh, political reporter at BBC Essex, the local radio station. Moved into uh, regional television at Look East. Uh, spent a bit of time at Five Live as a reporter. Then uh, took what was a slightly um, interesting move and, and worked overnight reporting for two years on um, the BBC's World News Channel. And then uh, started doing little bits of presenting and um, that built news, business, World Service Radio. Um, and about six months ago, took the decision to go freelance. So um, I'll be looking to get some advice as much as anyone <laughs> on how to make that work. Um, interesting fact about me. Um, it's always difficult when you're asked to come up with one about yourself. Um, in 2002, I was actually sitting on that side of the audience. I was on the program that was then called TVYP, which is now the network which you're all on now. If you had said to me back then that I would be sitting here chairing a panel and doing what I do now, I would have said, I'd love to, but tell me how I get there. So that is the purpose of this session. So those are the questions, those are the introductions. Um, it's all about giving you the chance to ask as many questions as you'd like. I know some of you have tweeted those in. Thank you for those. We'll, um, we'll weave those into our conversation. Um, but if you haven't tweeted them in, please have some questions. Uh, you know, if you've got ideas from what you hear people discussing on the panel, jot them down and we'll, we'll come to you and, uh, and get as many of your questions answered, hopefully, as we can in the next hour. So let's start by um, thinking about the personal attributes, the skills that you need to, to get into the industry and to, to have a successful career in TV and digital. Um, Bianca, we'll start with you with this one. You started out on a, on a TV training scheme, didn't you? Um, how do you go about making an impression when presumably you're there with many other people and you're all trying to stand out? Up, sorry. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so I would say, really, your enthusiasm is going to be key. If you show that you're enthusiastic, then those who are in the professional seat already, um, if they feel you're keen to learn, they'll be keen to teach you. Um, but you need to show that you're enthusiastic. Stay curious, which means you'll always ask questions if there's something you're not sure about or if there's something you've seen that maybe piques your interest. I'd also say you've got to be a really strong team player. Um, because working in television, as a few people I overheard what I mentioned before, um, it, it's not an easy job all the time. It can be a bit of a tough slog, long hours. People want to feel like they're part of a team where you know somebody's not going to let the ball drop just because they get a bit bored. Um, and stay motivated. Um, you're responsible for your career as a freelancer, um, so you need to kind of make sure that you don't let kind of past rejections or if you've sent your CV in lots of times and it doesn't get through, don't let that affect your future opportunities. Um, so going back again, stay th enthusiastic, you know, show that you're enthusiastic and hopefully you'll just roll with it. Okay, and Lee, what are the sort of personal strengths that you found are essential to have when you're trying to, to break into the industry? Um, well, I think it's, it works, yeah. I think it's important <laughs> to, um, uh, to work hard, as we all know. It's not, it's not all glamorous, you know. There's, there's really fun parts to the job, but all of the gloss and she sheen that you see on television, that takes a lot of work to get there. Um, be personable, be friendly to everyone, because you're going to see these people again and again and again. You know, a lot of the jobs I've got through is just because being nice to people and working hard for them as well. And um, it's not quite a personal thing, but be interested in digital as well, because a lot of TV... Uh, outlets increasingly have got their own digital and you're all young so you you know all digital you know digital like the back of your hand I'm sure okay um Natalie uh, it is a notoriously tough industry to crack very competitive we heard in that film there you've got to strike that balance between being persistent but not a pain and too pushy where is that line how do you find it uh, I'll let you know when I find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it is a hard line. I mean, I think I think there's um, maybe the answer lies somewhere in knowing yourself actually. And I, I think a lesson that I we, I'm still learning myself is it's probably about confidence. It's sort of not. You said it, Bianca. It's not um, 
it's not allowing yourself to be to be knocked back. You will fall over countless times on the road, and you have to get up and sort of keep going. And I think one of the things you have to do in TV is be quite pushy. It, it just is an industry which is moving quite quickly. Um, it's very much about who you know. It's very much about who you can have a meeting with and a conversation with and foot in the door and all those phrases is what you you know you know and you hear all the time. And I, I actually relate to. Um, Starting out, and you know, you haven't got a ready made network. I didn't have a ready made network. I was just a kid growing up in Birmingham, absolutely loving factual TV, watching Life on Earth and The Centre Man and all those big things, and thinking that's what I want to do, but I have no idea what that means. Um, and it is just about finding those people who can mentor you, help you, and take you on, and actually keeping yourself in their face, you know, just sort of keeping at the top of their their list, the top of their inbox, on their radar, drop them a text. Hi, I haven't spoken to you for a few months, just wondering if I could have that cup of tea. Nobody minds that. Um, so it's kind of pushy in a nice way. Uh, don't ever worry about that. And just back yourself. Have that confidence. Because no one's going to give it. It's not going to arrive in the post in a golden envelope. You know, you've got to have that, that sort of confidence to keep going yourself, I'd say. Um, and Sarah, you see, you, might, you must see a lot of newcomers, especially, you know, across the different productions and, and places you've worked. What to you stands out on a CV? What is it that someone can say or do that makes you think, of all the ones that have landed on your desk, this is the person I'm going to bring in and have a chat with? Um, yeah, because I do see quite a few CVs. Um, keep CVs quite concise. So pages is, is not good when you get sort of three or four pages of CV, especially um, now starting out, you're not going to have a huge amount of credit. So be really specific about what you think your skills are. Things like we spoke before about team being a team player. If there's a specific thing that you've done or been part of, maybe you've led that team. You know, you emphasise that kind of thing because that sort of shows that you know you're willing to work and you work well in a team. Spell check your CV. You'll be surprised how many CVs I get. I, I read and I think, my God, that's you know, I won't even look at it if you can't spell. And so triple, quadruple check. Get somebody else to check. Um, you know, sort of how you, you know, you lay it out nicely. There's all sorts of PowerPoint packages that you can use. So, you know, something that looks good that you've really thought about it. And as I said, nice and concise and really specific about, you know, achievements. Or if you've made your own film, you know, put a Vimeo link. Things which, you know, people can pick up on and, and you know, can show. It doesn't have to be specifically something that you've filmed. But, you know, something you've done in your life up till now, which... Um, might lend itself towards making a good, you know, team player. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, we'll just have a quick show of hands. Um, I know you've not been here very long, but um, how many of you have already got phone numbers, business cards, email addresses from anyone that you've met here? So that's impressive. That's almost everyone. Yeah. Um, that's a really, really good start. I was worried we were going to have one or two hands and that was it. <laughs> that's really seriously impressive. That's the first step. Um, I just wonder what advice you can give um, Nat, I mean, about how you then use those contacts that you've made to, to, to best effect. I think you should definitely use them. The first error all of us make, and I've done it so many times, is to sit on it. Is to think, oh yeah, I'll call that person, I'll email that person, I'll do it when I get home, when you get home. I'll do it next week, I don't want to look too needy, you know. Just do it, okay? So the first thing is actually use it. The second thing is you be respectful of that person's time. Um, not because they're a boss or a whatever, I don't know who these people are, just because they're another human being, they're probably busy, so be respectful of their time by being really concise when you get hold of them. And I think the thing you have to always, you know, sort of, I'd say this to myself still, is be willing to answer the question, why? Why? Why do you want that conversation? You know, and they'll say to you, and you know, it's this, this whole session getting into broadcasting, are you sure? Are you sure you really want this? Why? Why do you want it? You know, and be willing to answer that question. Um, we had a question actually tweeted in. Um, I sort of wanted to put to you, Lee. It was from uh, Marit Benner, who said, um, what advice um, can you give for networking on social media in terms of making contacts? What are the, the do's and don'ts? Well, social media, it's like life, right? You get back from, what you get back from it what you put into it, you know? Um, again, like in the real life, in, in the real world, do not 
bo bother people. There's nothing worse than trolling people online and badgering people the whole time. It's not going to get you anywhere. Um, make sure you get your stuff out there. If you want to make films, get yourself on YouTube, you know? People aren't just going to come to you either straight away. If you just, like, post something, don't expect, like, 100 retweets straight away. Um, engage with people who engage in your stuff, you know, because that's how you're going to get a response to what you do. And on a more personal level, be mindful of how you use social media for you personally. Show your personality, but don't put anything, say, that you think, would my boss hate this? You know what I mean? Just be, be mindful of balancing that, that personality and professionalism. I think there is an element of that as well. I mean, the, the test that I always kind of apply when I'm putting stuff on social media is, is it something I'd be happy to say on air? And if the answer's no, I kind of think, oh, maybe, maybe not post that. Save it to draft and think oh, about it later. Would you be happy for your grand to read it? Yeah. That's, That's a good, a good one. one. I use yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah. But I think there's also, it's interesting because there's also a balance. You, you don't just, I mean, if you look through someone's Twitter feed and all they're doing is asking people, give us a job, give us a job, give us a job. You're like, oh, crikey, this is, this is hard work. So you kind of want to, to, to give a little bit of your character, show a little bit of what you're like. Um, but also, you know, you want to, to be posting links of, uh, if you've put stuff on Vimeo and YouTube, posting links and, you know, pin, pin the tweet. If something you're really proud of, pin that tweet at the top. So if someone does happen to see that you followed them and they check your account, that's the first thing they see because you can control that. Yeah, and, and prepare yourself, you know. It's, it's social media. Pe it's there for people to give you feedback. So you're going to get positive and negative stuff, you know. You can block people that are really negative, but it's going to help you grow in the long term. Um, any questions based on that, uh, that first section on you know, kind of skills that you've got, you, you need to, to show the personal attributes, how you make contacts. Uh, if you've got any questions, we'll take those. We've got one there. Yes, can you just wait? Let, let's get the mic to you so that anyone watching it later on YouTube can, uh, can hear your question as well. Um, would, you s sorry, uh, would you say it's still possible for someone to get in the in industry without using any social media at all? Oh, good question. Do you think? Oh, I think I think you've split the panel. I think you could. I'd say no, but that's because it's what I do. I want to hear your take. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say it depends on what you specifically want to do. I mean, I work in production management, which is sort of the logistics side, the coordination, the overview. Um, we're not looking, you know, we, we sort of don't come up with the ideas per se, which are to go on the screen. So I wouldn't expect... Um, if I was employing a production secretary or coordinator to have a whole load of social media, I mean, for me, it's about how good they, how organised they are, you know, sort of um, those sort of attributes and to being across things and and wanting to, to s you know, they're really good at scheduling. They're very, um, they've got a lot of attention to detail, that kind of thing. So that's the side that I come from. So social media, that's not a big thing when I'm looking for somebody. So it really depends on what you want to do within within the industry. On my side, um, the kinds of roles that I look for are all editorial roles, so kind of runner, researcher, um, up to exec producer, for example. Um, I think in regards to social media, you don't have to have you know, Twitter and Instagram, but I think you'd struggle if you had zero online presence. Mm. Um, you know, because a lot of a lot of us um, talent, talent execs, talent managers will advertise roles on things like Facebook, or will advertise roles on Talent Manager, will advertise roles on LinkedIn. These things might not seem like social media so in per se, but it is still you having an online presence, so you can link into that conversation, mm -hmm. so you can see where the job um, opportunities are. Um, I think you know, even when it comes to work experience, we advertise that on LinkedIn at ITV. So, so you'd need to have some kind of online presence, I believe, um, to go forward in the industry. Uh, for me, I think the answer is definitely no. And that's because... Um, no, you don't need I it. Don't, I don't presence. think you need it still. I mean, it, it could certainly help. And if you look, look for someone and you find them on LinkedIn, and it, it's useful. I think for me, the number one thing, if, it, if we're talking about people trying to really trying to break in here, or maybe you've only been in TV for less than a year and you're just looking for that real foothold, it's, it's about demonstrating what you love. Um, the number one thing for me is passion. And maybe that's because I've always worked more on the factual side and, mm. the, and the journalistic side. I just want to be convinced that you really want this and that you are genuine in your love of it, you know, wh however you define it. Um, and you can demonstrate that to me in, in any way. Um, and if anything, a lot of people who um, 
maybe have, because it's an instinct at that age, you know, often, you don't necessarily know it, have that sort of hunch or that instinct that they want to get into factual TV. Uh, they probably haven't got round to putting themselves online and giving themselves a nice profile and this and that, so I would never, I'd never look, look you know, negatively on that. I, oh, you can Sorry. hang on, so I've got my own one here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise I'll be booming. The um, thing I would say as well is that it's never been easier to put stuff up that you are proud of. Even if you don't have a, you know, a regular Twitter account or Instagram account, you know, you can upload stuff to YouTube and Vimeo. You don't have to keep, you know, maintaining and going back and, and keeping it active. You can just put stuff up there and then it's a link for you to send someone. And then if you get to the point where you've got a few cuttings or clips or um, some things you've worked on that you're really proud of, you know, you can build your own website. There, you can get free templates. Um, that's how I did mine. It cost me nothing except the kind of subscription. And then you've got something that you can send to people as a, as a link. Because I think that, I mean, I, I wonder about, you know, do people, when you send a CV on paper, do people, or email, they, they, so many come through that actually, if you've got a link that someone can click on that shows what you've done and has a little bit about you and, you know, maybe a nice professional head, head and shoulders photo that, that someone's taken for you, it just gives that kind of really polished, impressive look. And I think if you're talking about first impressions, I think that can, um, that can certainly help. So let's move on to the next section, which is about how do we start or how do you get into the industry? How do you find that first job? Um, I'm sure many of you will have been told, get work experience, as though you can just pluck it out of the air like that. We all know it's not like that. We all know it's very hard to get work experience before you even get a job. So uh, Bianca, just to get your thoughts on this, is it still important? And how do you get it if you don't know anyone in the industry? Gosh, it's... It's, you're right, it's not easy. Um, you do, I would say, something like this, what you're doing, for example, you're meeting a whole lot of people who are at the same level as you, around the same age as you, everybody who's going forward and wants to gain opportunities. Keep this peer-to-peer -peer network going, because sometimes the way you get work experience or you get to be that additional day runner on a show um, where somebody's fallen ill is because somebody you've met here calls you up or says to their production manager, oh, my friend, blah, 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 you know, she's around, she's interested, he's around, he's interested. Um, so I think it's, it's about kind of establishing your contacts, keeping in touch with as many people as you can throughout, throughout you know, the course of your career. Um, and also, I do think work experience is really, is really important because it just, it gives you that opportunity, like the guy was saying in the video, to be around professionals, to learn from people who have made a career out of X, Y, or Z roles in television. Um, and it can also help you to decide maybe what genre you want to go into, or you might walk in, into a television production e work experience placement and think, oh, I want to be an assistant producer, and then you come out thinking, no, actually, I want to be something else. So it always kind of helps to inform you. Um, as far as kind of getting work experience and it being easy, uh, it's not, I'm not going to tell you it's easy. Um, even our Insight uh, pool, ITV, has you know lots and lots of people. And when we advertise for work experience placements, there are a ton of people that apply every time. But you've just got to keep going, again, back to staying motivated. Um, Natalie, I'd just like to bring you in. Um, is your um, background is interesting. You studied zoology, then into factual programming. That all seems sort of very planned and very certain. Um, but I suppose a lot of people might think, how focused do you have to be on having a set path or a genre or a type of field you want to work in? Is it OK to not be sure? And one question we had tweeted in from um, Sinead, who said, I'm not really sure what my end goal is. How do I seem open minded and eager, but not as though I'm lacking an objective and direction? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that you still have to be sure of something. So wherever you are on, on your journey, we're, we're all on different journeys, I'm still on a journey, I, I have to be able to tell the story of what I am doing now, what matters to me now, why I am doing the things I'm doing now. And that's true for all of you guys, just like it is for all of us. So, so I think be sure of that. Be sure that when you're having that cup of tea with whoever it is, or you're writing your, or you're videoing your lovely video that's gonna st stand out in Ben's inbox, you've got, you've got to be saying something. So you need to know what that something is. And if it's not written in four sentences at the front page of your journal or in your iPhone, then you haven't worked it out. So work out what it is you're saying that you're here to do. What is your offer? So whatever team you join, whatever business you join, what are you offering to bring to that situation? And if you can articulate that to yourself, 
for right now, it might change. It could change a thousand times in your career, but articulate it for right now, then you can tell other people, and then I think you will start to stand out. And Lee, we've heard talk of networking, networking, networking. The event is called The Network. It seems like that's the way to get on. How did you find it, and, and what's your advice to people who may feel really shy about it and really awkward about the whole networking thing? A again, it is tough, and you have to, you know, I, I didn't have any ins at all. I grew up in this rough council estate in the, in the Midlands, and like, on benefits, and I had no, no, no inclination. I just knew I wanted to work at the BBC since I was like a little kid. Um, and for me, it comes down to people again, and personable, and, being, and people skills. I, I did social media for like a few people, and I was working in a bar in London, and then this one guy who worked there happened to be uh, work on Newsnight, and then the next thing I know, I was plonked in front of the editor of Newsnight, <laughs> saying like, so what can you do for me? I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> 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 but like, um, you, it really does about being friendly, and it's, confidence is a strange one, because it's such a fine line between like, listening and confident, not arrogant at all, like learning and being confident in yourself to, that you can offer something different that no one else has. It's interesting, the confidence thing is a really good point. I was, um, when I was at Channel M, we had someone who came in on work experience and was just kind of shadowing on the breakfast program we did. And um, when we had the, the debrief meeting afterwards, um, the editor said, anyone got any thoughts? What did you think of that segment? I can't remember what the segment was. And normally, when people are on work experience, they don't say anything, because like, oh, keep your head down. She was the first one to speak, and she said, I thought it didn't really work. And you think, crikey, that's a bold move on work experience. In the end, the editor loved that and gave her a, gave her a job. It got her in for a couple of weeks, saw how she could do as a runner and a researcher. She, she then really impressed during that, that couple of weeks, kind of freelance work, and then when a job came up, she was, you know, first in line for it. So there is that thing of confidence. But we all sat there and thought, gosh, this is, this is bold, <laughs> this is brave. I do uh, have a counter story. To oh, go that. on, go um, on. <laughs> balance it up, it's balance just, it up. Uh, be, be mindful as well. Everybody wants you to be confident, and as you gain more experience, you, you, that will help. Um, but there is a story uh, at ITV where somebody was on work experience in daytime, and they marched into a meeting about um, kind of a forward planning meeting and kind of said in front of the editor of daytime, you can't put this on because it's X, Y, and Z to X, Y, and Z people and blah, blah, blah. They had a, they had a bit of a go, let's say, um, at the team. And needless to say, they, they didn't come back. So, you know, just be mindful of your audience. You know, it's great to, to be confident and say what you think might not work but you can't um, just berate people. You have to come up with a solution. You've got to be constructive, I yes. think. That's yeah. the thing, be constructive. Mm -hmm. and it's how um, you do it as well it's in, how in you the do right it. moment. Yeah. And be, be, I suppose be more confident about being positive. So suggest ideas rather than perhaps kick what people may have spent a long time and a lot of money working yeah. on. Um, Sarah, I just wonder, um, from the, the, the various places you work, what are the jobs that you would suggest people should look for as a way in? What are the, the variety of jobs that people can get a foot in the door with? Well, the runner is, is sort of the obvious one, which is kind of you get in and you're doing a, a bit of everything. Um, it depends. I mean, I didn't start as a runner. I started as a production secretary, actually. And it depends. If you want to go in the production management route, then coming as a production assistant, production secretary is, is a possible um, way of getting in. If you're wanting to go into research editorial, then you want to go in as a runner. Uh, you might want to work in studio, you might, you might want to be in cameras or technical, you know, get experience on live shows, that side of things. You might want to be a floor manager. I mean, there's all different areas. Um, but it is, you know, running is probably the best option to, to get in on the ground floor level. And then you get, you get to have a, a look around and see exactly, you know, what job there is that you might want to do. Um, and I mean, I got into television. I didn't know anybody in TV. I was having a drink with a with a friend from uni who just got a job on the Big Breakfast, and I said, "Are there any other jobs going?" And I, I'd had production secretary skills, um, not production secretary, so secretarial skills. And they were said, she said, "Oh, they're looking for a production secretary." I thought that was going to be like a secretary. <laughs> no. Mm. Um, on Hotel Babylon, I managed to get the job. I mean, it was you know, I went for the interview and. It's just about really being passionate and enthusiastic and really just, you know, I, you really want the job. It's the enthusiasm. It's not like, mm. oh, you know, 
I kind of want to get into TV. It's like I really want to get into TV and know your market, know who, if you, if you get an opportunity to have an interview, know everything about that company that you're going to see, you know, what they make, the people there. Don't just turn up and just go, you know, you know, expecting it. I completely um, agree. Preparation is, preparation, is key. Yeah. Um, there might be sometimes, because you know, sometimes we do hire on a very fast turnaround. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be asked for a runner on a Monday, might be asked for a runner to start on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And sometimes you don't always get a lot of time to prep, but they know that. They know that you would have just been called in that morning for an afternoon interview. But when you do have the opportunity and time to prep, do as much as you can. Even that interview is just for one show. Yeah. So, you know, look it up online. See who, see what happened in the last series. Get a bit of a blurb. Have a bit of an idea of it. Um, because then that will help you feel more confident about what your potential role might be. Mm. I think one point that I would just make that, you know, often when you've finally got that that appointment or that coffee or that, by the way, if you're ever, if, if anyone says to you, yeah, pop in for a chat, prepare. It's not just a, you know, how was your weekend? And that's it. it. That is basically your chance to impress and shine. And one of the easiest mistakes to make is for them to say, so what did you think about the, what do you think about our program? And if you say, I, I've never really watched it, uh -uh, you're not going to go any further with that person. So it's an obvious thing to say, but it's a mistake that catches people about in interviews, even though they're very experienced in the industry. They get an interview for another job and they'll go and they haven't watched the program. And, you know, you can almost be certain that you're not going to get the job if that is the case. And also if you go into a company which specialises in factual documentaries and you get an opportunity to, to you know, at, at this stage, any opportunity is a good opportunity. But if you go in and say, oh, I really want to work on a live shiny floor studio show, that's the wrong, that's the wrong sort of answer at that time. So you really know what that company, what genre they're making, because any experience is great experience. Even if you do want to be on a shiny floor studio, but you get the opportunity to work on a documentary, take it. I mean, as a runner, you know, you're gaining all, all those skills, you're meeting people, and then you can work, you know, you can work your way across, but sort of really focus on what that company is doing. And one of the first things I was ever asked to do in any TV context was to go to M&S and buy a bra for a then famous presenter. Obviously, I will not name <laughs> names because I would never mm -hmm. be that indiscreet. Male or female? No, you can't <laughs> say. <laughs> I'd leave that to the imagination. Um, and, I, you know, I could probably look back now and, you know, you read this lovely thing about all the things I've done and sort of how, how did that relate? Well, I think it really did relate, actually, to, first of all, working out how to sort of deal with that kind of request, which was basically shouted in my face on the day, which wasn't okay. So I think, you know, every sort of situation you find yourself in, you will definitely learn something, whether it's how to deal with a difficult person, you know, be resourceful. There's, uh, there's a learning opportunity in everything, isn't there? And it, it really will stand you in good stead later on, even though it seems unconnected at the time. Um, have a think about any questions you've got on getting into the industry. Oh yeah, we got one there. Yep, if we just get the microphone to you. Um, you talk about confidence but I suppose if you're just starting out and you might not have all the skills that maybe you need for the role, then how, how much do you, does the other person think about that? Because obviously you're not going to be a full package. I'm glad you picked me up on that word because um, I think I mean something quite specific in the context of this room and the conversation we're having here. And I think it's about knowing yourself as much as you possibly can, as much as any of us can, frankly. You know. So, of course, you aren't walking in there armed with having had every type of job in telly, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you can demonstrate that you're thinking about who you are, it's like what I said earlier, who, who am I right now and what have I got to offer to you, this person I'm having a conversation with? Um, and there's some self-knowing in there that, that if you're on the other side, if, if, you know, if we're, say, having a conversation and I'm looking to hire, that, that comes across as some confidence. It's not arrogant, which is great, because nobody likes arrogance, but it's just a sense of, okay, here's a really interesting young person who is already thinking about what she wants to do and what she can offer, um, and she seems quite self-confident. And for me as well, I think confidence is about not being scared to fail because that's how you're going to learn. That's going to be your best lesson in, <laughs> in this industry. 
Definitely. Uh, Nobody expects you, sorry, Ben, to come out with, you know, all the skills because that's why you're there to learn and start from the beginning. Um, but you might have skills somewhere else that you, you didn't realize actually could help you. So, for example, in my experience, my very first job at the BBC, I got because I had spent a year working at Marks and Spencers in customer service. So as far as they were concerned, M&S is like the top customer service place. So she must be good with customers. And my first job was about meeting and greeting guests, getting teas and coffees for people who had booked our studios, that kind of thing. So they, they felt from that that I could handle that kind of interaction on a customer front. That's what I could offer them. And I think just to, to add about the confidence thing, if you get knocked back, don't let that knock your confidence. Because I think all of us on the panel, for every job that we've got, there are maybe three or four others that we didn't mm. get. And you just have to keep going and you know keep that confidence and you know keep the enthusiasm and passion for it. Because if you don't, someone else will, and they're the ones I who will get there. I think enthusiasm is the is the the key word. Really, you know, show that enthusiasm and determination that you know you this is really what you want to do. The passion about it because that will stand you know stand you out. Right. Let's move on to the next bit. So. Let's assume, oh, sorry, we've got one more question. We've got another question at the back. Yeah, yeah, no, go on, go on. This is, the, this is what it's all about, asking questions. It's great. We, you know, the more questions we have, the better. Um, oh God, this one's for um, Natalie. Um, I've just graduated from a zoology degree. Hey, hooray. Yeah. Oh. Not, not from Oxford, though, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to know, did you find it difficult going through the transition from science to, like, the TV industry? Um, yes, but in a good way. Because um, for me, I mean, I, by the time I did a PhD, so by the time I came out of uni, I was really certain that I didn't want to go into academia. Even though I loved academia um, and held it in great, great high regard, I just knew it wasn't the world for me. Um, having said that, <laughs> one of the first things I did, um, which was work experience, was uh, for ITV, actually. Um, and there were some quite crazy things going on at that time. I mean, I, I'm 46, so... I was entering TV, you know, quite a while ago, um, and there were still crazy things like champagne fountains at parties on Friday nights and editors, you know, lying in corridors asleep, having come in from the pub, and all these things that never happen anymore <laughs> were still kind of the norm. Um, and, and it was quite a culture shock. Uh, and I will just say, I know this has been recorded, but I'll keep it clean. I did, whilst delivering... Um, some film, actual film, you know, the cans with the film that goes around from one place to another inside ITV. I walked into a room and two people were. <laughs> so I quickly closed the door again. Well, in fact, the person, th the, the guy screamed at me, you never saw this. And I sort of closed the door. <laughs> and I phoned my mum and I went, oh God, mum, what have I done? <laughs> so it wasn't like it was that anymore. No, no, it really isn't. I mean, I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not going to judge it. But anyway, so it was a big jump. But for me, it was a jump in the right direction because I just needed something more creative, more, you know, open-minded, et cetera, et cetera. But good luck, and I'm, I'm gr it's great that you've got a zoology degree. Nice, thank you. Right, um, we'll move on. Um, we'll go quite quickly through this section because I want to leave plenty of time for questions afterwards. It seems like, you know, you've got plenty that you want to ask. Assuming at the end of this, um, people have done a fantastic few days, they've got, you know, they've gotten in, it leads to a, you know, a few weeks' work experience, it leads to a bit of freelance work, it leads to a job. When you're actually in the industry, um, if, there's, if there aren't many permanent jobs, start, start with you, Sarah, yeah. there aren't many permanent jobs, how do people survive as a freelancer? Uh, asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for my experience, I've never been in the freelance, because I've worked um, at Princess for nearly 20 years, so I grew with the company. And in the production management side of things, you can tend to stay in one company and grow with that. And because you're all about the infrastructure and the, the sort of the overview, and it's quite good to have a grounded same sort of team because it's a sort of a safety net. Whereas more in the editorial side of things, you're different ideas and you're looking for new, you know, sort of new input all the time. So people do tend to go more freelance. But I would suggest again coming back to that enthusiasm, that passion, making yourself, you know, really a, a great person to work with, a real team player. Your producers who go on to the next job, they'll want to take you with them. So, and then you'll start, you know, you'll go to different places with them, then you'll meet new people and they'll want to take you with them and then they'll start fighting over you. So that's what I would say is really make yourself indispensable and really great to work with, really part of a team. You put in the passion, you put in the enthusiasm, the hours, whatever it takes. 
And then I think then then you know you'll get asked back, and me and Bianca will know she'll go for the same. You know the people do. Oh, that's a good person to call. See if they're available. And you just you build up your network. You know you build up the people on your your dial on your you know in your phone or you know the go-to people and then you'll go back to the same places as well we have lots of people come back to princess time and time again they've gone off and then they come back and you find it's quite a small world in the um, industry and what stands out bianca when you're looking for new staff what is it that makes people stand out to you um, I guess it, it also depends on the show in particular uh, for the freelancers, but mostly if I'm meeting somebody, a lot of times I do have just speculative chats with people, even if I haven't got something in particular um, to see them for. If I'm meeting somebody, I'm looking for someone who has a positive you know, vibe about them, for want of a better word, um, because like I said, sometimes we have to build teams quite quickly, and I need to feel convinced that you're going to be motivated. You know, when we call you up on the Monday and you start on the Wednesday, you know, um, time is, is precious in television production. Budgets are getting tighter by the minute. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not, it, you know, people want to work with somebody that's going to kind of, you know, pull up their socks and for, you know, use of a Love Island word, graft. You know, just keep, keep grafting. That's what I'm looking for. So, yeah, not um, in that Lee. way. <laughs> You, good advice. Yeah, yeah, good caution, good caution. Um, when there are so many people kind of going through the different production um, teams, you know, people pass through, how do you keep standing out? How do you, when there's not much chance, not much time to make an impression, how do you make an impact? Well, I just use my hair. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but if you don't have a big fight, honestly, it's what these guys said. It's like, it is, it is passion again. And, and just be prepared, especially when you're starting out. You're going to have to work extra hours. You're going to do more. Because when you get to our level, you're still doing extra hours. That just doesn't change, you know? That's, that's going to be constant if you want to get into broadcasting. So I would just say passion, enthusiasm, positivity, because there's nothing worse than coming to work and someone's got a miserable face on them. <laughs> when you just, <laughs> that, you don't need it. Yeah. And Natalie, how, how would you advise people to kind of keep the skills fresh? I think two things on staying fresh. One is just watch stuff. Watch stuff, okay? On, I don't care what screen, the big screen, the small screen, you know, feature film, YouTube, TV, whatever. Just watch stuff. Because the more you can demonstrate that you watch it and you consume it, and you've got a viewpoint on it, that's important as well, the better. I think the second thing is, see can take feedback. Honestly, that is the single best bit of advice I was ever given by an ex-boss. Um, you know, this is a sort of industry where it's very people-based, it's project-based, it's very creative, the creative process, all these things constantly change. In fact, I think the only thing that stays the same in telly is that it's always changing. And you've got to take feedback on yourself. And the more feedback you take on yourself, your style of working, whether you, wh you know how you just wrote that bit of the CV, whatever, ask for advice, ask friends, ask the taxi driver, ask the hairdresser, whatever. Just take the feedback and keep staying fresh yourself and keep learning. That, that's the best thing I was ever advised. And just to add to what Natalie was saying about feedback, if you ask someone for feedback and they're generous enough to, to give you the time to sit down with you, Whatever you do, don't get all defensive if they're giving you constructive advice and then you say, oh, but no, I didn't want to do that because of this or because of that. You know, just sit there, kind of bite your tongue and, and say, mm, mm, mm. And then if, if they want, you know, if, if you feel it's appropriate, then say to them, well, what I was thinking when I chose to do that or made this decision or that decision was this. If it didn't work, how could I do it differently? But yeah, if, if you're asking for feedback and someone gives you feedback, don't get all defensive about it. Um, right, I want to leave some time for questions. And um, before we do, just want everybody stand up. Everyone, no matter whether you're a delegate or you know everyone here, everyone, all of us, all of us, we're all going to stand. Up. Okay, right now, stay standing. Stay standing if you know exactly what job you want to do, long term, ultimately. Stay standing. Stay standing. Okay. Well, that's most of the panel. There we go. There we go. Right. Okay. That's it. It's a good mix. Good, good mix. Um, Stay standing if you know exactly how you're going to get to that job that you want to do. Okay, oh, we've got, so this is good, this is good, this is good. Stay standing if you've never felt worried or scared about getting there. Oh, we're down, my goodness. Oh, sorry, I should be sitting, I should be sitting, sorry, I should have sat down long ago. Um, and, and, stand, and stay standing if you have never had to ask anyone for advice. Okay, that's correct. That's right. I was hoping if anyone was standing at that point, I'd be really worried. So, no, well done. And it doesn't matter at what point you, s you sat down or stayed standing. Um, it's just to kind of prove the point that all of us, all of us have had to ask advice 
um, especially when we're starting out, you know, and we all still do. You know, when we, we're facing decisions, as I was saying to you, I made the decision to go freelance about six months ago. I spoke to so many people because the more people you speak to and get advice from, the better. Because everyone takes a different path, everyone has a different route to where they've got to, and you can learn from their experience and also their mistakes because it stops you making the same mistakes that they did. So this is your chance. Whatever you would like to ask, um, as I say, don't feel any question is too small or too silly. No one is judging. This is your chance to ask whatever you'd like to ask. Just I'd, all I'd say is let our runners get the mics to you so that if people are watching the recording, they can hear your questions. So questions from you guys. OK, uh, let's get right in the middle there, just there. Uh, Hi, um, yeah, thanks for the panel. Um, so I've just finished um, my master's in documentary filmmaking. So like, I'm really interested in like factual documentary, and but I'm also interested in kind of bridging that gap between like art and filmmaking. And I'm really struggling kind of with like that that bridge at the moment. So I'm interested in that how that has a space in the industry, and like just the space kind of for like like kind of maybe avant garde documentary, like experimental kind of. Um, like media, things like that. I don't mind jumping on this one. this one. Um, good question, and I think you're articulating it. it. It's hard, you know. You're articulating it because it's hard. Do you know what I mean? It's it's a stri it's striking you as hard because it is hard. Um, there's probably not an obvious single route. If I'm understanding you correctly, are you saying that by art do you mean fine art? Uh, yeah, like a fine art background. High yeah. concept art, right? Okay. Um, there, there will be ultimately a number of ways. I mean, I think first it's about deciding uh, where you want to be in the creative process. Do you want to be the director slash the filmmaker? Do you just, do you, just you, know, do you want to be in a different role on the team? Um, are you interested in the ideas generation side of things? You know, and sort of being quite specific, given that you're already quite specific about which area you're interested in exploring, then get even more specific with yourself. Do you want to be on the ideas side or the production side, etc.? Um, and then I think just try and find two or three people over the next six months who might be good contacts for you. Um, and, uh, you know, find one or two production companies that make that type of film. Find a broadcaster that airs that type of film, you know, that you would hold up as being the sort of film that, you know, you'd love to make. Um, and then maybe one or two people in art, art institutions as well, who maybe not on the TV side, but could just be good contacts and mentors for you. And, and try and get a cup of tea, and they might open their contacts books to you. Uh, so I was just going to yeah. say something like um, Sky Arts. Um, I know that Phil Berger Jones is um, around the, um, this conference as well, but it'd be, they'd be a good, if they've got a store, I don't know if Sky Arts, or maybe Sky probably got a, but they'd be a good place to start, because obviously that's quite niche in in that area if, if you want to combine we got art uh, with doc sorry to interrupt i just want to get as many questions yeah, as possible yeah. so have we got any more questions um yeah just there gentleman there hi uh, so this is a question for everyone but mainly natalie and lee because you're from where i am birmingham <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right bab all yeah. right bab <laughs> <laughs> um what advice do you have for someone that i don't like <laughs> um for someone that's not in london in this sort of industry, because they all say that's where it's buzzing, but... Well, for, uh, I think things are different now. I moved to London, it was 20 oh. years ago nearly, and do everything was in London that, then. You know, now they're starting to spread things out to like Media City, BBC Three are going to Birmingham soon. Um, there's lots more opportunities than, than when I was up Dudley, you <laughs> know. <laughs> so I think um, it depends. If you want to move to London, um, you can. It's an, it's an amazing opportunity for personal development and professional growth. But if you don't, there are other ways you can do it. Are you... So, are you, are you keen to see if you can make it work in Birmingham at the moment? Um, yes, really. And have you, do you know anyone in, in BBC Birmingham? A couple. Yeah, and, y and BBC has also put some investment into digital, yeah. so up in Digbeth, yeah. and there's stuff there. So I think if that's where your head is at just at the minute, yeah. then just try and find some friends okay. in, in the places. Maverick, you know, there's a, there's a couple of good um, production companies that have... Um, whether they have headquarters there or not is kind of irrelevant. You just want to find people who are making yeah. stuff there in the area. And um, I'd say don't be shy about it. You know, if you write a really concise, clear, friendly, short note to people, honestly, you'd be surprised at how many people will say, yeah, I'll have a cup of tea with you. 
Yeah, keep an eye on BBC Three because they are moving up there, and you know they're they're looking for people who are local from different backgrounds. And I also, can I also I was just going to say because I've, I I spend um, part of my time in Manchester every week, and m London does have the monopoly of everybody. So actually, being regional it can be a good thing as well because we don't get as many you know there aren't that as many people and there's more and more jobs which are coming up in the re in the region so you know it can be a good thing to get yourself in there any more questions uh yeah gentleman there in the check chat uh this question is for lee um as someone who tries to produce stuff to put on online platforms myself apart from youtube facebook and twitter what other online platforms do you look at to try and ident identify new talent? Well, good shirt, by the way. <laughs> <It's going there>. <laughs> <laughs> um, those are the main ones for me. But there's other things like Vimeo are doing some stuff as well, and they're trying to uh, uh, branch it out to uh, like young filmmakers. That one's worth checking out. Daily Motion too. I, I basically advise putting everything you can everywhere. Snapchat as well. It's a great way, a different way of telling stories in kind of a sh even shorter form. So I would just advise to get it out there as much as you can and make sure you interlink all of your social media platforms so as you're cross-promoting, you're sending them to people as much as possible too. And uh, I can say from experience, um, if you've got a name that isn't all that unusual, snap up all the different handles so that it's the same across all of them, if you can. It's a small thing, but you know, if you can then have it consistently across all of them, that really helps. Um, take one more question uh, at the front here. Just get the mic to you. Um, I just recently managed to um, get um, my first um, industry job as a researcher, and I was wondering if you had any tips for researching basically um i've never done it before i'm hope, hoping to learn on the job um so yeah it, oh it's in scripted as well so it's oh, scripted so drama it's oh. but but ed, any help with anything <laughs> um i think in, in essence they'll what do you know what show uh, it's for hollyoaks for hollyoaks okay did you join a pool maybe was it a writer's pool they advertised um, or it something? was through the Channel 4 training scheme. Okay, well thing. done you, like, congratulations mm -hmm. on that. Um, in regards to kind of researching for scripted, um, just kind of harking back to the old grey matter in my brain, I think, in all honesty, the research will be down to what the storyline is. So if there's a character with a mental health issue, or there's a character that's gone through, you know, a, a miscarriage or, you know, something like that, or, or there's an accident, you know, it's about kind of finding out what actually does happen during X, Y, or Z periods? Um, you know, if somebody's been diagnosed with an illness, what are the um, what are the pointers that we need to look out for so that you know we can make sure the character has those in the script? That's what a researcher would be doing um, for them. So it's just about kind of reading everything, keeping you know um, you know keeping any information in your brain, um, not kind of you know shutting yourself off to any platform where you can find information. And that's what I would say you do. And talking to people as well, not being yeah. afraid to talk to people. Yeah, pick up the phone to that professor. Lots of people are ever. scared of talking nowadays. Yeah, so don't like be scared to talk. I can only text, but <laughs> talking's important, especially for any research job, is getting yeah, on absolutely. the phone, talking to people who know about the specific thing you're looking into. Mm. Yes. I think we're, we've just come to the end of the, um, the time. It, it's gone very, very quickly, but um, you know, I'm, I'm around for the next few days. I'm sure these guys are around for at least some of the festivals. So if you've got any more questions, you know, feel free to come and find us and ask us. I'm just going to finish the session, um, and, and given that we're, we're in danger of running over, um, I get 30 seconds each. We've got a time, time limit. We've got the clock. Um, your top tip for getting a job in broadcasting? I think I've already said it. Make sure you can spell on your CV. <laughs> I mean it, honestly. Good CV. Network, network, network. You're never doing enough. You think you are, but you aren't. Um, uh, by the way, uh, there used to be this thing called TV25, which was an early precursor of you guys. I was sitting where you guys are sitting now. In fact, I think quite a few of us on this panel were. Um, network, honestly, just keep getting to know people. Um, like they said, be passionate, be positive, be open-minded, be willing to learn, be yourself as much as possible, have some confidence in you, and, and remember, ultimately, it is a great field to work in. I'd say stay motivated. It's a competitive industry, so you've got to keep going. 
my tip, I suppose, um, I'm going to steal from a friend of mine who works as a script editor on one of the big soaps. I speaking to him a couple of days ago. I said, what would, what would be your top tip? He said to me, be nice to people. Whoever you meet in the industry, be nice to people. Because, as he said from personal experience, the person who is your work experience person could one day end up being your boss. So always bear that in mind. Be nice to people, whoever you meet, no matter what job they're doing. Um, uh, just one last tip. I can give two tips because I'm chairing, so I'm, I'm allowed. Um, this is an amazing opportunity, but it's what you make of it. So uh, while you're here, you've got access to a huge amount of experience and expertise and advice. Go and speak to people. You know, be confident. Go up and speak to people. And, you know, in doing that, you might be shy, you might feel awkward, but lose your inhibitions. I was saying, how can I help you with that? Well, I can't give you confidence. I can't help you lose your inhibitions. But, and it's only going to work if we all do it, okay? Um, I just want, you know, just completely to relax, to set the tone for the start of the, the few days. Just shout yeah when I ask you the few questions. Okay, so are you going to have an amazing time at the festival over the next few days? Yeah! <laughs> are you going to speak to people, make loads of contacts, get lots of advice, and get plenty of, of numbers and email addresses? Yeah! Are you going to get into broadcasting? Yes! And has this been an amazing session with brilliant panellists and a wonderful host? Yes! You're going to go far. You're going to go far. <laughs> Guys, um, just very quickly, just to say thank you uh, to my panel, Bianca Joseph, Natalie Humphreys, Lee Dalloway, Sarah Buckingham. Um, I'm Ben Bland, and this session's been produced by Daniel Morrissey. Uh, thank you very much for uh, in taking part and being enthusiastic and coming up with all the questions. Enjoy the festival and have a great evening tonight. Thank you. Hi. Um, so can we just say another big thank